Hi guys, this is Rohit and today we are back from feature engineering. So today we are talking about feature selection. So why feature selection in the first place, right? So as much as feature engineering was an important part to the entire machine learning paradigm, so is feature selection a very important part. Uh, probably not as much widely used in uh, industry as feature engineering, but definitely let's say that that feature selection constitutes a very, very important part of all kinds of machine learning applications that you will probably end up ever doing, right? So this is a very, very uh, critical thing, uh, probably not as widely applicable, but definitely a very critical thing. So that makes it even more important to understand this thoroughly, right? So feature selection as the name suggests is basically all about kind of selecting the right features, right? Now, obviously, the very first question in your mind, right? Why would you even want to go ahead and select features in the first place, right? Why not just train everything with all the features that you can avail of, right? Because that always seems uh, intuitive, right? That you, if you have a higher number of features, better accuracy, right? So we'll get to that bit in a moment. So I, I, let's let's appreciate that there's a, there's a dilemma out there that obviously more information is always better results. So why would you even want to kind of reduce down your information? That just doesn't make sense, right? If it's not useful, the model probably would not learn from it, right? That That's a natural intuition that you would have that, hey, if, if these features are not useful, uh, model would not learn anything from them, right? Why do we need to kind of remove them? The model should be smart enough to kind of figure out that it's not important and relevant and hence, it's, hence it should be kind of discarded, right? So that's a natural intuition. Keep that in mind. We'll talk about why do we want to do feature selection in a while. So program so far, obviously, uh, basics of Python. Uh, I, I'm sure I've kind of told this multiple times. This is the part you have to be very, very clear and very, very uh, hands on with right now. If you are not hands on, stop the video right now. Go back, go back, have a look into it. Uh, come back again. It, it's okay, uh, but definitely let's get familiar with Python before you kind of jump ahead. Uh, descriptive and inferential sets. Yes, that's something that is extremely crucial to understand uh, certain concepts of the session today. So if you have not understand hypothesis testing, if you have not understand p value, if you did not understand uh, uh, confidence intervals, all of those kind of things. So p-values, hypothesis testing specifically, if you don't understand uh, those concepts, uh, this part is probably not gonna be very helpful. Obviously there are things we can, we can always kind of have a over the top look and that's perfectly fine as well. But it's always helpful if we can uh, kind of go back, have a look into those kind of things and come back so that way we can have a better idea of what we are talking here. So that that's one heads up. Apart from that, we have done linear regression. We have done L1, L2 re regularization. So we understand what are concepts of re basic regression, what are concepts of overweight, overfitting, bias, variance. So all of those things are some things that we are familiar with. And basic data cleaning and pre-processing, yes, that we have done. Feature extraction, feature engineering, that's the last session that we have done. So that's perfect. We are very familiar with what, what are the things that are mentioned on the slides. And I'm sure we are we are pretty familiar to kind of go ahead and have a look at this. So what are we going to cover today? First is importance of feature selection, right? The first thing that I talked about. Uh, then we are going to talk about some of the methods about them. So don't bother about this kind of things. Uh, next, we are going to cover about some overall generic methods uh, about feature selection. Uh, and then we are going to do a walkthrough exam. So that sounds perfect, right? Everything's covered. So now let's get into the core meat of the session. So John is in a fix again. So John was a content. John was content with what he learned from feature engineering and all of that. But then he looked into features and looked puzzled as he saw some features got deleted and other got added and his brain was again in a chaos. Okay, so John is basically someone who had built a model using feature engineering, but then there's some problems that he's facing, right? So what is feature selection? So in machine learning and statistics, feature selection, also known as variable selection, attribute selection or variant subset selection is the process of selecting a subset of relevant features for use in model construction. Sounds fair enough, right? It's just basically nothing but if you have 100 features, you want to somehow select 90 features, right? Out of 100 features. So how do you do that? And why do you want to do that is the first part. And the feature selection bit is basically how do you do that, right? So why do we want to do feature selection importance, right? 
so this becomes even more important when the number of features are very large so first use case you have huge number of features right say you have 500 600 features now imagine training uh, you are probably not acquainted with some of the better machine learning algorithms as of yet uh, that is that's what some of the next sessions would be gonna be around so if you kind of talk about some of the more sophisticated uh, elegant methods of machine learning uh, something which I slightly on the higher side of computational costs uh, those algorithms are gonna take a hell lot of time if you try and run on 600 700 features or probably 1000 features so that's why it's very important that you kind of you know you don't want to run into that because you want to do multiple experiments doing a different hyperparameters and uh, different mm, evaluation techniques and all of that so if you want to do a very very detailed kind of a very heavy experimentation kind of a thing then definitely if you use a uh, thousand odd features that's never definitely not gonna help so you need to cut down from thousand to a more reasonable number right uh, that reasonable number would depend from algorithm to algorithm the way you are doing but definitely somewhere in the range of 100 200 would be helpful right so that's a that's the first use case then the second use case is uh, you need not use every feature at your disposal for creating an algorithm now why is that case which is basically the reason being the third case is that uh, you basically what happens when you have a lot of features is also that some of the algorithms like the way you have learned about linear regression right so linear regression forget the l1 l2 kind of modification just the basic linear regression as it is right you know that if you don't kind of take out the unimportant feature what will happen is that you would get a weight assigned to that particular feature right every feature if there are thousand features you will have a weight for each of those features now problem with that is basically even though that feature is probably absolutely irrelevant right because you have it in your data set the model basically learns that it, it basically understands that there's a weight that is to be given to that and it tries and learns that weight right now problem with that is basically it's trying to assign some importance where there is absolutely none right so that's a problem with kind of doing uh, all features together right so that's why if you know that there's something which is irrelevant now you can probably also think of it that hey the algorithm should basically assign a very low weight uh, which could happen which probably could happen if it's trying to but what you know the whole gradient is something in linear regression right so what if it doesn't converge right at the minimum point at the convergence point if it does not converge then probably you would end up with a model which probably might not even be able to assume uh, give minimum weightage to the most irrelevant feature right so if it's not converged it probably would not have learned that this feature is relevant in that case it would end up giving it a significant weight which is actually a problem so hey take a step back if you know that there are features that are absolutely irrelevant right you absolutely know that there's no use of this feature in this data set feel free to kind of go ahead and remove that right so that's the idea that's why you want to kind of assist your algorithm uh, and obviously the better and this kind of is something that you would kind of become more clear as you kind of go to more uh, heavyweight machine learning algorithms later on that if you can assist your machine learning uh, algorithm with better quality and better richer quality of subsets right that's why you do feature engineering right because anyways feature engineering is basically kind of combining some features and getting something out of it right there's a new feature that you create by combining some features now obviously you can there also you could argue that the machine learning algorithm should have basically figured that out right it should be smart enough to figure that out that this is the new combination that you need to do but obviously that's that's a very tough job right uh, as of now so to expect that your algorithm would basically be able to figure out complex relationship between your features and uh, be able to learn based on those things is a sort of a i would say yeah aiming for something pretty high at this point in time at 2018 why we are talking about it uh, definitely there are ways and those are more advanced techniques to kind of make sure your model learns those kind of things but for purpose of this course and this curriculum that we are doing right now uh, it's, it's absolutely important we kind of feed our machine learning algorithms with richer subsets of features right uh, richer relevant important features as much as possible right so why do you use again so it enables because obviously you can reduce number of feature features size right from thousand to say hundred so that makes your machine learning algorithm train faster right uh, secondly it reduces the complexity of models now that's again something that we have to talk about uh, complexity of model and the second the third point which is basically uh, 
easier to interpret right so there are two parts so problem with what happens if you use thousand features is if you say there's a higher weightage in feature some high or probably equal weights in some 15 features uh, it's very tough to interpret what kind of feature actually contributed to the decision making process right so you want to kind of uh, look back and say you know when you kind of doing your analysis of your models right or probably when it's used in live production you want to kind of look back and say hey i think this model basically predicted that uh, the house price in new york for this particular house should be something like this and then you should be able to kind of go back and see i think yeah the price was predicted high because uh, oh i see the living area was high uh, garage area was also decently high and those kind of things right so you should be able to interpret your models that is a very 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 important component of machine learning and for you to be able to do that you need to have meaningful relevant features in your data set if you have a lot of irrelevant features right and say 15 of them uh, probably come out to be say relevant now that that's something you cannot really kind of make a sense out of right because uh there are a lot of irrelevant features probably combining them in some way probably would make some relevance but as it is if you just see there are 15 features which are not so relevant but all of them have decently significant weight and they kind of contributed to the decision making uh it's tough to interpret those kind of models right so that's why again you want to kind of take out your relevant models because for sake of interpretability that hurts right so that's it and obviously i talked about the accuracy bit and how if it's, it's awesome if you can kind of make your data set more richer that's the same thing that you want to do in feature engineering there's the same thing you're trying to do in feature extraction sorry feature selection and then is reduces overfitting obviously that we have something that we're already familiar with when we saw the l1 l2 example right l1 l2 regularization bit we saw that when we use a polynomial features how our model kind of uh, tries to overfit right so the more number of features that we give the more over tendency to overfit right so obviously lower number of features we can kind of also control overfitting so that's that's the whole point why we are doing feature selection in the first place right so a lot of advantages actually now you look back your computational cost goes down you're helping your model learn better you're reducing your in overfitting kind of chances and then you're increasing the interpretability of models so that's a whole lot of reasons why you should want to kind of do feature selection again uh you depend on the amount of feature selection you want to do now obviously you can feature selection is a broad thing you can kind of go from thousand to nine hundred you can go from thousand to five hundred you can go from thousand to hundred you can go from thousand to ten right so the number of features you want to kind of select at the end of the day is a choice that you make uh, and we'll talk about that also in a bit uh, but that's about it right so you need to do feature selection the amount of which uh, we'll talk about it later but definitely there's an advantage to doing feature selection so there are two kinds of feature selection that are there uh, first is univariate and multivariate obviously the second one so now let's talk about univariate feature selection Univariate feature selection methods examines the predictive power of individual features and the strength of relationship of the features with the response variable. Uh, These methods are simple to run and understand and they also prove to be good for gaining a better understanding of the data. So what is univariate feature selection? So univariate feature selection is you go kind of look at every individual feature at like it, it's not like you're looking all the features together and then kind of coming up with some kind of way to go from 1000 to 900 you're looking at each feature and they're saying hey I, is it relevant yes or no kind of a thing right then looking at the second and you're looking like hey is it relevant okay yes or no a uh, multivariate as opposed to that is where you kind of look at the entire bunch together or probably groups of some numbers together and you're like hey this group as such is relevant or not right or probably uh this is the entire bunch now out of this probably 50 makes more relevance than the rest of it so that's a kind of multivariate kind of analysis univariate is you are looking at each feature at one time and saying hey is it relevant or not is it relevant or not that's the idea right so we can look at uh univariate selection we can look at inter interaction between the top variable instead of all possible combinations uh these methods are not necessarily good for optimizing the feature set for better generalization so obviously the problem with univariate is that when you're looking at each of them individually uh the problem is the same thing that happens right because uh in case of say we talked about univariate uh outlet detection and multivariate outlet detection if you look at individual features probably five ten of them are all of them are 
in in univariate analysis all five ten and features probably would come out to be relevant separately individually but when you kind of combine them in a group probably then they would start to make sense so that's the problem with uh, univariate feature selection as compared to say multivariate feature selection so now we are kind of getting so now we understand what are what is uni what is uh, why what is feature selection why it is important now we are getting to kind of how we do it right so first up this is the first method uh, and then the first method of univariate selection right univariate analysis so first method is removing features with low variance now let's take a pause and understand the concept so when you are trying to remove features with low variance what are you trying to do so basically you have your features x1 x2 x3 x4 and all of that and what you're doing is you are saying that hey this has got a lot of variance probably let's keep this uh, this has got very low variance right say so this is just the variance right and let's remove this similarly in this case a lot of variance let's keep this and probably like in a very small variance out here right so what does variance basically say variance is basically the distribution of the say assuming it's a normal distribution it's the amount by which your data varies right so this is basically a this is high okay high variance and this is low variance now with low variance the problem is this right so your data is basically kind of just limited within very small boundaries now why is that something that you don't want what basically this means is low variance basically kind of implies is that your data in that particular feature right so in this particular feature say x2 right in x2 the data is basically not varying at all a bit right so basically all your values are probably uh just you know kind of lying within three four values right so it's probably every value is between say one two three right let's say one two three your all your values in x2 are basically between one two three and that's why you have a very low variance whereas in this case you have values between say one two thousand right so why is this bad because this basically says that hey the data is almost same in all the rows right so basically there's a not lot of variance in your data so that what basically that implies is that that just kind of constant right you don't want to there's not much of a variation basically means that basically the variable that you're trying to predict say this is basically the color of house or say not color color cannot have say any other continuous say this is the uh garage area or something of that sort and this is basically the price that you're trying to predict right so sales sales price right so this is sales price and this is what you're trying to predict and the problem with this is that if you're trying to predict sales price and sales price basically goes from say all the way we have seen how it varies right it goes from all the way from hundred thousand dollars to two sixty thousand dollars right something of that sort and what we now here see is that uh, if your sales price varies in that huge variant and your garage area basically hardly varies across your examples that probably just says that uh, yeah probably the garage area is not probably actually you know even if it changes or it remains constant or whatever it is it doesn't affect the sales price right because it's basically not changing much at all so even if there's this very low variance that basically says that it's the change of whatever change is there in garage price basically doesn't affect sales price so garage price is probably something that is not relevant to this particular exam to particular this particular data set right so variance is one way of kind of very easily figuring out so if lot of variance basically means that hey the values quite change a lot right so that probably says that hey that could probably be somewhat connected to the sales price because sales price is also changing quite uh, widely and compared to that the thing that i'm trying the feature that i'm trying to use also varies a lot so probably there could be some meaningful relationship now if you're the thing that you're trying to predict is varying a lot and the feature that you have is 
hardly varying at all right in that case you know that that feature is probably not important because it's just the whatever is it's almost constant right so there's not, no use of kind of using those kind of features so that's our whole concept here so we want to remove features whose variance don't meet some threshold right uh, so there, there's a slight kind of thing that to be a, a bit cautious about here which is not here mentioned here uh, which is basically the fact that variance uh, is awesome and fine but keep that in mind variance is always scale dependent right so if you're measuring variance of say uh, distances as compared to say variances in number of people in class uh, as a distances where I'm talking about distances say within India and number of people in a class so the variances of those two things would be absolutely very different just because of the fact that number of people in class cannot be in thousand ten thousand or millions right so that that's a problem uh, that you need to kind of keep in mind uh, that variance as a as a concept is something that is scale dependent so whenever you choose threshold you have to keep that in mind that hey i think and even better obviously before you do all of this it's always better if you kind of reduce them down all to same scale right all your features to the same scale before you do this kind of an analysis so that's the thing that you need to keep in mind and also the second thing actually now that we talk about is always keep in mind that you need to keep your threshold in comparison to how your target value is changing right if your target value is also say for example not changing a lot then probably uh, removing low variant features doesn't make a lot of sense right because uh, if target is also not changing a lot so is not this feature so probably there could be some relationship you do not want to remove it but if your target is varying a lot and your feature is not really changing that much that probably says that the feature has got not much of a contribution to that sales price right so the relationship is not really that strong so that's why uh, uh, for example a feature with this is a thing right that what we were talking about a feature with zero variance means that it has basically same value for every sample that means such a feature would not bring any predictive power to the model right so that's the whole concept so you should remove features that have basically low variances so uh so john thought if you had a data set with boolean features right so now as i was saying so variance as a concept is something that is scale dependent and normally associated with continuous variables now what if you have a categorical variable in case of categorical variable how would you kind of measure the variance so in case of categorical variable if there are binary just zeros and ones we have talked about binomial distributions right so basically now you can assume that there were uh, so say there's a feature like um, was there a garage or not right in case of house prices so that's a one zero kind of a feature so now one there would be some cases there would be one there some other cases there would be zero now you can imagine this being a binomial distribution where n is total number of houses in the data set p is the probability of success of number of times there were houses actually there in the data set and 1 minus p being the probably where p is basically number of houses that had garage by total number of data sets uh let me kind of just do this for you uh, i'm not sure if you're getting this so if you remember this was a binomial distribution right and see uh, p to the power r q to the power n minus r if you remember this was a binomial distribution so in this case n is number of samples in the data set p is house with garage by n q equals to 1 minus p right so number of houses without garage so this is number of houses with garage and so this is a formula for binomial distribution if you remember uh, and the variance for this distribution was p into 1 minus p. 
right? So n into p into one minus p. So that's the concept that he is that we are talking about here. So variance is given by p into one minus p. So from this you can basically kind of conclude what is the variance of that particular threshold. Obviously, for example, if you see that p is completely one, right? So which is basically all houses have garages. So then your variance comes out to be zero. Similarly, if all houses don't have house, don't have uh, p, if, if basically if none of the houses have garages, so then p equals to zero. In which case also your variance comes out to be exactly zero. So you get the concept out here that even if it's a categorical variable, you can measure variance, and you can use or you can basically what you, you can basically set a threshold saying that anything which is less than this variance can be dropped off right away. So you can basically do something like this from sklearn dot feature selection import variance threshold and you can directly imply that so we are talking so this is the concept that we are talking about here so in this case we basically first import this module variance threshold and then we basically uh, say what is the threshold that we want to set so in this case we say that uh, we want to set a threshold at least that 80 percent uh, there should be the probability of be there being a garage should be either 0.8 uh, or probability of not being a garage should be around 0.8 right so basically 80 percent of the values should be of one type and 20 percent of other type anything which is more than that say 90 percent of one type and 10 percent of the other type we should reject it right away so 80 percent 20 percent is the variation that we are fine with so remember this this is in the case we are doing for categorical variable you can do the same thing for numeric variable in numeric variable the concept is easier you just say a point blank what is the number that you want to kind of reduce it by so in this case we are saying that the variance threshold is uh, the kind of anything which is basically has more than 80 20 kind of a division so when we do that so we can see that this is the data that we have in this kind of cases right so the uh, in this case there is actually all the data points are all the features are basically here uh, except the last column right so the last column is basically something so you're not the last column uh, yeah the first column the first column is the one that we have got rid of right so because the first column had basically zero zero one zero zero so out of the one two three four five six values right out of the six values five of them actually had zeros and only one of them had one so that's the kind of distribution we do not want so that's why the first column in this data right has been dropped out here and you have the rest of the two columns that that's something that is pretty clear to you right so that's why we want to use this is the kind of cases where we want to kind of use uh, variance as a threshold bar right so if anything less than a variance we should drop it so the next concept is uh, Pearson correlation now we have already talked about correlation uh, in the inferential statistics lecture so again the concept is here is very similar like variance basically in variance you are kind of looking at individual feature and just kind of deducing that whether this feature is varying a lot or not and based on that you kind of took a decision where to kind of threshold in case of Pearson correlation the idea is exactly same you have almost same basically it's where you're trying to kind of correlate your features with your target variable and see that if there's any relationship or not if there's no relationship drop it right so that's the idea uh, that's very it's it's almost similar to variance threshold as well right so basically you're just kind of instead of taking individual feature as it is you're just kind of taking the feature and the target variable that you're trying to predict take their correlation and then just see if that is beyond a if that is beyond a threshold then just drop it right so uh, the population correlation coefficient between two random variables expected uh, with expected values mu x and mu y and standard deviation we have talked about all of this you know how this is calculated the whole covariance formula and that it can range between minus one and one and anything which is zero which is basically kind of says that there's no linear relationship anything which is minus one or towards plus one says that there's a strong linear relationship plus one is positive linear shape positive uh, relationship negative minus one is negative relationship so we have talked about all of this so there's no point uh, walking over this again so that's so yeah again so there's nothing around it so what we are doing though here is basically that we are using scipy's pearson method which apart from calculating the correlation coefficients also basically 
tells us the p value for the correlation showing how roughly showing the probability of an uncorrelated system creating a so you know what p value does right so we have talked about this in, and this is the part where inferential statistics kind of come in so if you remember p value was basically the concept that you know there was a null hypothesis and basically what is the probability of finding an example so extreme that as compared to the one that we have in our data set to kind of support that null hypothesis if probability of that was very low we say that null hypothesis probably is not valid right because we cannot have such an extreme data set so p value was nothing but the probability of finding such a extreme uh, sample size to support our null hypothesis and in this case what we are doing is basically calculating the correlation coefficient and our null hypothesis is this correlation coefficient actually is equal to the one that we figure out and the alternative hypothesis is not that this correlation coefficient is not actually that so now we do that and we kind of calculate the correlation coefficient so the first values are correlation coefficient the second values in the tuple is basically the p values and in this particular case we can see that the p values are all extremely significant right so these are all values which are less than 0 0.001 almost which says that hey given this sample uh, probably the co correlation values that we have calculated are actually true right so that's the idea that we have here so the correlation coefficients can be calculated to a very uh, strong precision out here and now that you calculate so you, what what you basically see is that with smaller amount of noise the correlation is relatively strong and with a very low p value right so now we have calculated the correlation coefficients so the correlation coefficients for each of the column along with the target variable in our case the target variable was the uh, last column that we had which was the sales price and everything we had everything before that as our features now for every column we kind of get the correlation coefficient between that column and the target variable and what we do here is get the target the correlation coefficient and the corresponding p value for it so now what do we observe out here we see that with smaller amount of noise the correlation is relatively strong with a very low p value however for noisy comparison the correlation is very small and the p value is very high right so if that if there's a strong correlation and the data is not noisy we can basically have a uh, low p value and the correlation is very strong right so normally that's what you would tend to see if you if you basically have a lot of noise in the data your p value would be extremely high right if your p value is extremely low that means that you can actually very strongly say that that correlation is actually correct right whereas if you have a lot of noisy data the p value would be high because uh, you cannot very strongly co concur that yes this p value the p the the correlation that you have calculated is absolutely valid uh, irrespective of sample sizes right so that's why if you have a noisy data the correlation would tend to be a bit more strong with a very low p value however for noisy co comparison the correlation is very small and the p value would be tend to be higher so p value roughly indicates the probability of an uncorrelated system producing data sets that have a pearson correlation at least as extreme as the one computed from this data sets so that we have talked about right so p value is basically saying the probability of an uncorrelated system systems which are probably not at all correlated having a correlation coefficient as much as the one that we got actually from this sample size right so obviously if this p value is higher that means p value is lower that means that it's extremely unlikely that those systems are uncorrelated it probably means they are actually strongly correlated right if the p value is extremely low so pearson correlation obviously also is the ratio of covariance of two variables uh, to the product of variance of those variables uh, we have already talked about all of this so just keep that also so now while we talk about the first point just understand that Pearson correlation is nothing but basically a ratio of how your variances of x and y kind of change right along with each other so when you are doing in the first process you are doing kind of variance threshold and I talked about the fact that you know variance threshold is an awesome way uh, but not so awesome when your kind of y varies also small and x also varies small right so your y is also not changing a lot x is also not changing a lot then if you kind of do variance threshold that's probably not a good idea you should only do that when you kind of you know y is varying a lot and x is not varying as much so that's why you kind of do that right so that's a problem with variance threshold as it is because you are not you're just not looking at the target variable at all while doing variance threshold you're just looking at the independent feature and saying hey this is lower than this variance reduce it drop it off 
that's a problem which kind of gets solved sort of in Pearson correlation right because in Pearson correlation you are not measuring variances of x and y together and if the variance is actually like if they're kind of changing actually very nicely with each other you have a very strong correlation in which case it makes sense not to drop them but if they are kind of one is changing a lot the other is not changing at all then you would tend to have a correlation which is normally around zero and that's the reason why you should probably use Pearson correlation to kind of drop features as compared to variance threshold right so you can see the inherent advantage of this right so obviously we have talked about all of this a value closer to zero implies weak correlation so one thing to note that while we're talking about correlation so that's an important way so correlation is not transitive so let's x y and z be three random variables so x and y are highly correlated around correlation is greater than 0.8 y and z are again highly correlated so does that kind of automatically imply that x and z would be also be highly correlated it's not that's the that's the whole point so rho and x y x z will be positive if rho x y and y z are very close to one uh, but that's about it so you can basically compute this so rho and x so if you want to compute rho of x y that is rho of y z into rho of z x minus this complex formula you can derive this at your own own leisure that's perfectly fine this is very easy to derive as such it's basically just deriving uh, correlation between two variables you, between whom you really directly cannot compute the correlation. You have the correlation between X and Y and Y and Z. Uh, and from that, uh, you have basically, sorry, you're trying to have the correlation between X and Y. You already have the correlation between Y and Z, Z and X. And using those, you are trying to figure out the correlation between X and Y. Now, the thing to notice basically that uh, you cannot directly directly you cannot say that if x and y uh, if y and z are high and z and x are high then probably x and y should also be high uh, there's a relationship and it may not always obviously if it's extremely if x and y uh, y and z are highly correlated it's close to one and z and x are also highly correlated close to one then obviously probably x y would also be slightly positive that's all you can kind of confirm now Next point is sensitivity to outliers. Once again, so is this correlation as a measure sensitive to outliers? The answer is yes. Why? Because uh, if you remember, this was a formula for calculating correlation x y, right? So in x y, we are basically measuring changes, ratios of variances, right? That's that's the whole broad idea we just talked about. So variances in itself are something that are kind of sensitive to outliers because you are basically basically changing differences from mean, right? Distances from mean. Now, distances from mean would again be something that is sensitive to outliers. Uh, so you're summing up the distances from mean, right? So that already would be sensitive to outliers because outliers would be normally be very far from the mean. So that's one thing. And second thing is mean itself is something, a measure which is kind of biased and sensitive towards outliers. If you have a lot of, if you have a few outliers in your data set, your mean could be biased towards this. So that's the whole point. So if you have outliers in your data set, definitely correlation is something that would probably pick up. So if you have a lot of outliers in your data set, you would tend to have basically your correlation coefficient probably going on go down, right? Because uh, it might. So in that case, your uh, if you're kind of using correlation coefficient, just keep that in mind that if you're using correlation coefficient and your X features has got a lot of outliers, well, 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 then probably there could be a bit of a trouble while you're doing all of this, right? So just keep that in mind. Uh, correlation shape also doesn't capture nonlinear relationship. So that's again something that you need to kind of understand uh, very, very thoroughly out here and that I've been mentioning in the last lecture also. Correlation equals to zero just says that there's an absence of linear relationship. That's about it. Nothing more, nothing less. It just says that there's an absence of linear relationship, right? So it doesn't talk anything about non-linear relationships. So uh, again, be careful if you're dropping features just using correlation coefficient. Uh, well, you could end up uh, losing out on features which probably could have been just uh, non-linearly related right so just keep that in mind uh, so in the image that you probably see so yeah in this image you can basically be able to appreciate this much better so these are the different correlation coefficients that you see here so in case you have c0 you can see that a uh, lot of those cases there are some very nice patterns that you see in the data set right so patterns in the data set basically say that there's a relationship it's just that they are not in a straight line fashion in the image that you see here right on top of here so in the second row you basically see the images and you see that 
there are a lot of minus one right so even the slopes are very different as long as this is the points are lying in a straight line you would basically have plus one right doesn't matter what is the slope the slope could be anything as long as it's a straight line relationship that's plus one or a minus one if it's anything less than a straight line relationship right for example in the first row second image you have point eight and then you have minus point eight on the right hand side right so you basically see that these images are again uh this these are points which are not lying on a straight line and hence uh this is something that is problematic so that's why you don't have a perfect one correlation out here same here you don't have a perfect one correlation and in case you don't have any relationship you have a zero as well but just keep that in mind zero could be also be the case that there's a perfectly non-linear relationship it's just that the points don't lie in a straight line right that's about it so that's the same thing that we're talking about here so Correlation does not capture nonlinear relationships. Log on to Gray Adams Learning Platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.